Thank you very much. And uh, thank you to Lauri and the team to, for inviting me back to Tallinn. It's great to be here. In a previous life, I used to hunt bots on social media. It was my, my job to go and track down different networks of Russian trolls and other kinds of fake accounts. And then generative AI came along and made it really, really hard to do. So I decided it's time to do something else. But basically, the question I want us to try to get through in the session today is whether generative AI makes it easier or harder to detect fake social media content and fake social media accounts. And um, because I can't talk for 90 minutes, no chance at all, I'm going to need to get some audience input. And also, I want to run a little poll. So you should be able to scan this QR code, which will take you to a little poll where you can vote on some questions. Is that working? Do you need me to make it bigger or anything like that? It works? OK, I've started that thing. So I want to basically collect a baseline, right? Because hopefully somebody will change their opinion in one direction or the other by the end of the session. Otherwise, we've all wasted our time. It's a lot of pessimism in the room. Um, could the tech guys switch onto my screen and then we can put the numbers up? So that was about 18 to 9 at the time you all saw what everybody else is voting. I don't know what kind of behavioral effects that's going to have. That's more or less done, isn't it? 1911. Um, so who's optimistic? Hands up. Who's the most optimistic? Who wants to take the microphone and explain why they're optimistic? <laughs> ah, come on. <laughs> All right, without the microphone. <laughs> Nobody, OK. Will any pessimists uh, venture an opinion? All right, who are the pessimists then? Look around. <laughs> I feel like there's quite a lot of you on the fence, but OK. All right, let's jump back, super. So I need to advertise my little company, right? So we do different bespoke data science projects. And that's not what I'm talking about today at all. But we work with a very small number of clients to do so in-house systems, when, when they find that what exists on the market is either not powerful enough, not secure enough, or not customizable enough. And then the other thing that we've been doing more lately is different types of consulting and training around how generative AI is disrupting different types of organizations, workflows, um, how it presents challenges, perhaps opportunities and how we can adapt our systems more securely. So I should say, I, before, before I did this, I was at NATO Stratcom COE in Riga. So it was a, this bot hunting I mentioned was a, a constant battle in terms of which are the systems we're actually allowed to use within the networks from that building. This is our agenda for today. So I'm going to go through talk a little bit about social media fakes, what they look like, how that has changed. Then look at how generative AI is, is changing what is possible and what adversaries might be doing. Then there's a section on whether we can actually det detect fakes with the tools that exist on the market today. And then I think I'm cautious, cautiously optimistic, actually. I've, I've thought about this quite a lot. and. Generative AI is kind of amazing for making these proofs of concepts, but it's really quite hard to build production systems around these models. So I think there's quite a lot of hope that it will not be the disaster that we might expect. And then finally, and then here I'm really counting on your input, is a discussion on whether we can actually use these, these um, tools in our systems, and we, in this case, is various government or military institutions broadly within NATO, typically constrained by 
a lot of red tape and bureaucracy. So who knows what this is? Hands up in the air. <laughs> okay, so this is not everybody, which is perhaps a challenge for our session. Um, this is what um, chat GPT looks like. Um, if, if you feel that the description in your program is nothing like what I actually ended up talking about, you can blame our friend. Um, so there's kind of a, quite a widespread sense at the moment that uh, generative AI is potentially disastrous, right? Here's an article calling it uh, Cambridge Analytica on steroids. And uh, this it kind of makes sense, right? You can put in, you can use these systems, give quite gen general instructions of the sort of text you would like to create, and the system will spit it out which if your job is to create fake social media content has got to be an advantage, right? This was last week, was it? Did anybody see this on their social media feeds? A couple, two or three nods. Probably this was not the Russians, even though it would be fun if it was, but this was probably about manipulating financial markets. So somebody put out an image which analysts say was um, created using an AI model purporting to show an explosion at the Pentagon. And immediately the market spiked and presumably somebody sold or bought something at this moment. And it was also picked up by various dodgy art outlets like RT, Russia Today. So this is kind of the, the nightmare situation, if you like. Um, fake content is created and has these real-world effects. In this case, it was very short. It was, it's incredibly easy to disprove. All you need is like a little webcam outside the Pentagon and it's immediately gone. But the potential is there if you can quick, quickly and cheaply create content that can have effects like this, moving markets, swinging elections, etc. So um, I'm going to do another one of these. So if you already loaded up the page, you should still be able to just use it. I think I need to click a button here. Next. All right. And if you haven't scanned the QR code yet, what have you been doing? I'm assuming everybody has mobile phones, but if anybody wants to give their vote in a different way, that's fine as well. Okay, guys, can we switch to, to my screen? Problem is, I don't know how many of you are actually in the audience, right? Is anybody good at estimating crowd numbers? It seems like most people have heard of ChatGPT, but my screenshot doesn't count, right? Yeah. So this was probably about what I was expecting. It seems like most people are familiar with ChatGPT, um, Bing Chat perhaps as well. Um, BARD is Google's large language model. It basically does the same thing. Um, most people think a bit less well. Claude is by a company called Anthropic. This is quite an exciting model because it's fast and you, it takes absolutely massive inputs. So you can paste in text up to 100,000 words and use that. So that's kind of amazing. GitHub Copilot is every programmer's best friend. It makes you write the code much faster, and it will basically do autocomplete for you. Midjourney, Dali, Stable Diffusion, and Firefly are all different types of image generation systems. And who's heard of, about GPT for all? Come on. <laughs> Who knows this system? So this is the one that I'm worried about. Um, this is where I think what we'll be talking about in six months' time. This is 
a very user-friendly system that allows you to run these large language models on your own computer locally. So you bypass all of the censorship or content moderation, depending on your opinion, that is built into ChatGPT. And I'm just going to very quickly go to this next one as well. So, you know, have, have you actually played with these tools? Have you tested what they can do? <laughs> you guys need to diversify your AI habits, honestly. So, unfortunately, I don't have any way of cross-tabulating whether you've used ChatGPT and whether you're optimistic or pessimistic or not, but... Sorry? Ah, well, that was... Should we redo that? Maybe I can edit it. Yes, good point. Um... If I stop it and start it again, maybe that'll work. What does it look like now? Are we on the second question, third question? Okay. Can you can we redo that, Paul? Does it work or not so much? No. What do I have to do to restart it? <laughs> Reset results. Is that oh, okay? Is it broken? I'm still only getting Chat GPT though. <laughs> it's still only one. Yeah. Mm, but most of them I want to be single choice. So I'm, I'm getting the feeling that we've got about six or seven people in the audience who are deep into this AI stuff, and, and, and about half are not so much, which might, might be problematic, I don't know. All right, let's continue with the slides. Oh, still some votes coming in, okay. Okay, can we play this video? So this is what uh, social media manipulation, kind of how it works, how it worked, how it functions. This is a commercial option where our friend is taking a selfie on Red Square and popping down into the Moscow metro station where he finds this vending machine, right? And he looks up his Instagram profile and the picture in question. And then he buys some likes, he pays his cash, he gets a receipt, yes, very good. And then the likes start coming in, right? So you can kind of... <laughs> you, 
you can kind of imagine how this system works. It's This machine is hooked up to a system where they have a pool of different bot accounts, and those bot accounts just automatically perform whatever action they're, they're asked to do. And this kind of stuff is kind of, kind of easy to detect, you'd think, right? Um, so in, in this old life, when I was at the COE in Riga, we conducted an experiment with uh, Senator Chuck Grassley. He's, uh, he's an elderly gentleman, but uh, he was very sporting in allowing us to mess with his social media profiles and stuff anyway. Um, so, so it's quite hard like, to find content that you can manipulate like this on a politician's sort of Facebook and Instagram page. Like, everything is very political, and you don't really want to have a political effect. But we found something he posted around Christmas time, and we wanted to see, can you use this commercial system that we saw in the video to manipulate a senator's um, Instagram and Facebook feed? And this was 2018, so everybody in DC was kind of worried about Russian bots at the time. And it turns out you can quite happily do this. Um, we've, we've repeated it since, so it's not that they fixed all the problems. It's just that the example is the best I've got. So this is how it works, right? On the left-hand side, you write the comments you would like posted. And then on the right-hand side, you can see those same comments being posted one at a time by a different social media user on the senator's... Um, is this Instagram? I think it's Instagram. They look the same. Um, so this is the, the old-fashioned manipulation. You type out the comments yourself. If we think about ChatGPT, instead what we would probably do is, we want to say something nasty about Senator Grassley. Can you give us 10 examples and then automatically post those across? This was the interface we used, so a Russian provider. Um, it's quite a lot of fun. You, maybe you can see, maybe you can't, it's a bit small. The list of platforms that they offer across the top, and there's also the other category. So if you go on other, Basically, they will, they will adapt the system to manipulate whatever you need manipulated. It, it, it's very... Um, the customer support is fantastic. Um, this is the ask a question tab, 24-7 service, um, customer support, etc. cetera. Um, when, we, when we purchased it, we even got a receipt with a Moscow-linked tax number. So apparently, it's a, it's a legitimate service. Of course, we couldn't do that anymore because of sanctions, but, uh, well. So, why, why do I show you this? I show you this because this is the kind of stuff that the social media platforms don't automatically pick up. You'd think if you were designing any sort of system to detect fake activity, this would be incredibly easy to detect. But still, it doesn't... It, it doesn't really work. So we shouldn't have much confidence that they're going to do really particularly well with generative AI either. Um, this is a, a follow-up experiment, much more systematic than with the Senator, where we took out manipulation on six different platforms for a relatively modest budget. This stuff is cheap. Like if, you're, if you've got a military budget, and you're, then, then these numbers are not the ones you're worried about. So the, the design of the experiment was basically, we created an, a, a blank account, we posted some content, so nobody else was going to see or interact with this. Then we went to the Russian manipulator and said, go and do these, I don't know, comments, likes, shares, whatever, of this particular post. And then we tracked you know, who actually was interacting with it. So it gives us the opportunity to say very confidently that anybody who interacted with that content was actually the providing the service for which we had paid. And then the other thing we did was, was measure whether the social media platforms were able to detect and, and stop this. So I might have given it away a little bit, but I think there's another question here. So I'm wanting you to guess what percentage the platform's systems automatically detected and removed.
So when you talk to the platforms about this stuff, they say, yeah, but you know, this, this is all in the long tail of, of social media activity that has very small effects. We're interested in you know, a million shares or likes or retweets. We don't really bother with this small stuff. They don't actually say we don't bother with the small stuff, but that's very much implied. Um, when we've tested with bigger things, that seems to have the same, the same effect. Um, yeah, let's go back to the slide. A very clued in audience. Basically, we waited four weeks and 95% of the stuff was still online, which I read as they didn't do anything at all because these accounts don't live long anyway, so the fact that 5% disappeared in four weeks is probably about what you'd expect. But then we went in and reported the accounts as fake using the reporting systems, and here, of course, the platforms performed much better, right? Five to twenty percent is winning this one. Um, no, not at all. Like, yeah. <laughs> so this is kind of crazy because if you're in an election situation or there's some sort of sensitive thing, if, yeah, yeah, we could have waited more than five days, but within five days the effect has already happened. It's it's there, and yeah, re reporting almost has even less effect, as far as we can tell. Here, what they say is that generally there's some sort of reporting threshold that's required, and probably we weren't meeting that threshold. You can think, is that a good explanation or not? I don't know. Do we want to talk about um, fake accounts anymore before we move on to the AI? It's a workshop. I'm, I'm really counting on some, some help from you guys to fill this time. Any questions about, yes, there's one at the back. I've got a microphone, but it might be easier to, you can just talk. Did you just hear me having the experiment with much larger numbers? Yeah. Yeah, the problem is, you, you, yeah, you don't work in one of these NATO think tanks, I imagine, but, um, our financial controller was happy with a three-figure sum. A four-figure sum would have been quite challenging. Uh, but what we did do was buy one million views on a video on Instagram. And that was delivered instantaneously without any obvious, uh, obvious effect. So, yes, of course, ideally you'd want to run these experiments in a situation where it mattered. But then at the same time, you would also be having a real-world effect. So it's, it's problematic from that perspective. And one more at the back. Uh, just a kind of similar point, but uh, specifically about the reporting of the fake accounts. Yeah. Um, did you try to maybe kind of expand or kind of increase the number of reports that you were kind of using social media platforms on fake accounts to see how that threshold made it? Did the threshold have a market value that percentage? Yeah, that's a good to report a lot of fake activity on the platforms, because what happens is you end up getting banned quite quickly. Um, it, if you're reporting a, a lot of stuff as fake, that's somehow triggering an algorithm somewhere that this is unusual activity, and then the accounts get shut down. So it, it's hard to do. And, and yes, we didn't, use, we didn't use high authority accounts for this reporting either. Of course, I, I imagine we might have had a different result if we would have used some institutional account. The thing that worked, though, was the day before the Senate hearing where we were presenting the results with um, Senator Grassley was visiting the Facebook's offices in DC and letting them know that this thing is happening tomorrow. And then about sort of 3 a.m., we were starting getting texts from them saying that, yeah, we think we found all the comments, but could you just go back and check that there aren't any left? Um, so they have a completely manual approach to these kind of problems. Yes, it was a few years ago, but we haven't seen anything to indicate a huge amount of change. 
And one more. How do you mean? So you were uh, a service to have lights, but other services which are actually reporting huh. other people. I don't know. Um, when it comes to reporting, you hear about it mostly in terms of brigading efforts, which is where, I don't know, Russian trolls get together to harass Ukrainian journalists or something. And I, I suppose there might be brigading for higher services. I don't know. But I haven't looked. Do you know? No. <laughs> no? Does anybody know? It's quite a hard service to advertise, right? <laughs> this was when it was fun hunting bots. It was really easy. They, they all kind of had really poorly developed profiles with very similar usernames. And then, but then quite quickly, the people who made the bots figured out that these were being removed and improved their systems. And one of the things that helped quite a lot was GANs. So GANs is one of those earlier AI technologies which by now is quite well developed. So here's an example of GAN images over, over the years. A GAN is a generative adversarial network. So this is where you have two models essentially competing against each other. One model is trying to trick the other model, and then the other model is trying to guess is the image gener generated by the computer or by a person. And then gradually the GANs get better. It's the same, um, yeah, it's, it's quite a successful adversarial learning technique. So 2014, it's like proof of concept. By 2017, it's already quite hard to tell that they're fake. Um, this is 2019, thispersondoesnotexist.com. Somebody's bought this domain, it's not live any longer, but it's quite a, a good example of what GANs look like. They are, I think these, these the GAN images are, are stronger than what you get out of Midjourney and the other newer tools. It's just they're very, very programmatic. So if you're, if you're looking for GANs on social media, the eyes are always in exactly the same part of the image, for instance, so you can stack them on top of each other and you'll see that they're probably coming from the same set. You can usually find artifacts like on this earring, where the earring sort of morphs into the hair. Um, the eyes are often a little bit funny, but basically it's quite, it's quite impressive, right? Like it's good. Uh, and then suddenly we were seeing networks of social media accounts that look like this. This is obviously a Turkish one and when you see the, the images all together in this way, you can kind of see that they're from the same source, right? Um, every picture is very much, very much the same. These are all from GANs, yeah. Um, is there a video here, or is it just a broken slide? I don't know. Is there a video on this page? No? What? I think there is, should be. Yes, this was, this was last week or the week before. Have you seen this? This is amazing. This is sort of real-time editing of the GAN. So this is what's coming to Photoshop, etc. essentially at the moment. This, this is pretty cool. <laughs> so if we are detecting pictures like those Turkish social media accounts, a little bit of editing like this and those accounts, suddenly the eyes don't line up anymore, right? So it gets harder. Quite a long video, should I continue or is this fun? <laughs> All right. This is the, I used to find this incredibly impressive and it's only two years ago, right? Like it's, 
utterly incredible how quickly everything is moving in this space. This was the first popular example of these AI systems doing genuinely creative things, in my opinion, right? So the input here is design an armchair that looks like an avocado. And magically, this large model is able to figure out what an armchair that is designed by an avocado might look like. I think it's quite good as an art project or something, right? Um, except that in the two years since, we've become so spoiled by what's come afterwards. But yeah, so this is DALI, the first um, image generation model that kind of goes beyond GANs. This was DALI 2, one year after the first DALI, and immediately the quality of the generation is much higher, right? And this is roughly where we are at the moment. Um, somebody, uh, somebody went through the list of all the presidents and asked it to generate um, every president, but he's cool and has a mullet. And they don't, yeah. So in terms of creativity and photo quality, this is on a, on a higher level. And Midjourney version 5.1 was released, I think, a couple of weeks ago, and it's more impressive still. One of the other things that's coming out, which is relevant for detecting these fake personas, is that you can generate persistent personas. So if you're generating GANs, you get one photo, and you can use that photo as a profile picture. But if you're really digging into, is this a fake page or not, you might look, well, does this, does this person have any other photos of themselves? And GAN-generated accounts do not, because there's just the one. With these models, you can, um, you can, the same way when you run statistical tests, what's it called? You can set the, the number. That means when you rerun the, the, text, the test with the randomness, you get the same result. What's that called? I forget. You can do it also with, with these new models. So you can put in some parameter, some code, essentially, and then you get the same model repeatedly. And somebody's designed like this, like calling it the deep agency, if you like. It's a bit, it's a bit shitty, you wouldn't use this. But it's a, it's a cool proof of concept of how you can take a generated persona and reuse it in different poses. You can move them around. So again, there's a video, I think, if we can play that. So what's happening here? You can customize, to some extent, the look of the model that you're trying to use. So the picture quality is a bit bad. Do we bother? Um, OK, you get the idea. You can change the pose, etc., And that goes as an input into the model. And it's not particularly precise. But you can sort of see that this lady in the top left is, has got her arm in the same pose. Um, we'll go on to detection in a minute, but like detecting images isn't too hard. Detecting audio, in my opinion, is, <laughs> is really tough. Um, let's play this. Good evening, and welcome to Tucker Carlson tonight. Let the ruling classes tremble at a communistic revolution. The proletarians have nothing to lose but their chains. They have a world to win. Workers of the world, unite. Um, I, I, don't, I don't listen to him very much, but I, at least to me, it's a persuadable, persuasive enough example of what he might sound like, right? So public figures for whom there are plenty of audio examples, this is becoming a very serious attack vector. So. Anybody who gives speeches in public is, is liable to have their voice cloned. And then there's all kinds of targeted attacks that become enabled, right? The yeah, call up your assistant and have them do a, the, the bank transfer would be a classic one. And it sounds to them like it's the right voice. All kinds of things like this. 
So you can generate the script that you want the persona to say using an LLM, and then you can use a different LLM to turn that into audio. So increasingly, you can automate most of this workflow, which in the past would have been possible using very specialist tools, but it would have been slow and it would have been expensive. Now it's getting fast. Um, I also have a Taylor Swift one, which is a similar kind of thing. Did anybody see these already? Am I boring you with old examples? Can, can we play this one as well, please? I couldn't give less of a fuck about my tickets being over $1,000. I don't perform to poor bitches. So again, I don't think anybody's really being fooled by these examples. It's more proof of concept, perhaps. But to me, this is very powerful. And I, I, mm, organizations that I know are not well positioned to protect against the possibilities that this enables. OK, this is, this is an old example. This is before chat GPT came out. So I think it's GPT-3, vanilla, normal one. And it's an example of where you can get GPT to produce sort of borderline problematic content. Today, I guess if you did this, it might say that as an AI language model, it's not allowed to generate uh, misinformation about vaccines, right? But at the time, this was working. So here, if we imagine that we are running a bot network and we want to put out anti-vaccine posts, we could use technology like this to generate five unique sentences in response to a specific post that we wouldn't actually even have to look at. So if we just have a list of content that we want to generate responses for, we feed in those one at a time, we generate the, the posts that gets cross-posted onto social media platforms through different personas automatically, in theory, at least, that entire workflow is fully automated. And the bit that used to be difficult, finding content that is unique, has been taken over by the, the, the GPT step of this workflow. And this is where GPT for all comes in. So OpenAI build all sorts of protection into their systems. They have a, an army of moderators who, when something is flagged as potentially problematic, it gets shown to a human and they make a decision. So at one point, I was able to generate you know, some uh, anti-Zelensky posts as created by a, a Russian troll. It was a sweary Russian troll, I think it was. Maybe the slide is even coming up. Um, but then when I tried to run that a second time, it refused to generate it. And that's because there's a human moderator in the loop somewhere who's been shown this on a screen, evaluate, is this OK or is it not? They've said it's not OK. And then the model learns. And gradually, the content moderation gets more powerful. With uh, GPT for all, you can run locally on your CPU, so no, no powerful graphics card required either one of a long list of models that you can download and install through this point and click setup. Mostly these models derive from the, the Facebook model that was open sourced by accident in January. But this is developing incredibly fast. So when I tried this first in, in February or March, it was almost unusable. Today, I think it's producing content similar in quality to this. So that's in about three months. So here's, here's the same example. It might be small to read. but So this is using a, a model that's been designed to be uncensored. <laughs> um, so there will be no content moderation here. Uh, generate five angry replies. Coronavirus is a man-made virus created by Big Pharma to make money off vaccines. Don't be fooled, etc. So this content would normally get caught by OpenAI. But now you can run it locally. So I assume in, in the months ahead, these systems will continue to catch up. And also, we're going to see less of manipulators using these centralized online models and increasingly running these systems locally on their computers. Um, yeah, here's a couple of those other examples. So this is not GPT-4. I, I do have that screenshot somewhere. I can show it afterwards, if you like. GPT-4 does much better um, angry tweets than this open-sourced model does. 
but it's reasonably good. And it's unique, it's on topic, it's, it's relevant. It's really hard to prove that this is fake if you see it on somebody's Twitter timeline. Um, another big trend in this space at the moment is something called retrieval augmented LLM. So if you like, that combines the power of the search engine with the power of the LLM. This is being, everybody is trying to sell some sort of startup essentially doing this at the moment. There's a hundred services called whatever, like um, a chat PDF or something like this, where you can upload your own PDF document and ask questions of that document. And it's incredibly simple to run. This is an old in, um, example, and it's, it's only about 30 or 40 lines of Python code. I think you could probably do it in half. Um, and this is pretty powerful. So there's an obvious use case for most organizations to hook up their internal documents, their knowledge base, maybe their code base, to this kind of system, right? So here's an example for a report that we published where I wanted it to generate a quick summary in different languages. It works quite well, although the Estonian is apparently crap. And, and also it will you know, generate social media posts that reflect the content of the report. So in my, in my old job, there is no way we would have been able to run this on the local systems, but at the same time, it's an obvious thing that whoever is running our social media account should have access to. Um, these new models are really good at coding. Actually, coding is probably what they do better than anything else, that and sort of making things up. So this was a, a simple um, website that I put together using GPT 3.5. In a, in a using using a language I don't know almost at all, and it, it sort of functional upload files to perform particular various actions on it, etc. This is where it's really great at prototyping simple applications or or workflows. Um, and the latest thing that they've rolled out to people who pay for this service is plugins which is where you can connect GPT to other services across the internet, which sounds like a good idea, right? It lets you do fun things like this, uh, like generating a video. So I put in some of the points that I promised to cover in this presentation and asked it to generate a video. And I don't know if this is going to work, but if you try clicking that link at the bottom, maybe it will play it. Or maybe it's dead already, I don't know. <laughs> This isn't going well. It, it worked yesterday, I promise. <laughs> it was loading much faster than this yesterday. I don't know. Is there any point in trying on this computer? What is this, 56K or something? Yeah, so I've got it on this one. Shall we try it here? I don't think you'll get much audio out of it, though, unfortunately. OK, so in the, in the proper video, the, the lady the AI-generated voice is reading this text, which is a bit more impressive than, than this endless scrolling. Why is there no audio at all? I don't know. All right, that's disappointing. If anybody wants to look, I'll send you the link. <laughs> Yes, so I submit, you can do it with a single line of text as well. And then it generates a script and it matches that script with 
open source video clips that are somehow relevant to the clip. And then it uses a different algorithm to generate the script, which is, which is red. And it's got kind of a cool soundtrack, cool soundtrack playing under everything. All right, I'm glad to see it hasn't fully replaced me yet. That's good. Yeah, so, okay, so connecting, connecting to the internet through plugins, what could possibly go wrong? Maybe we'll come on to that. <laughs> um, here's another example. So, so the input here is create an Instagram square ad for Klarna. Klarna something, Klarna, I don't know. So it's using a series of, of plugins to generate this, this image. Again, these are things that are kind of 80% good. So it's hard to imagine anybody actually using it seriously, but it's really impressive as a proof of concept. Um, this is um, possibly a dead end, I don't know. A, a big trend to use GPT um, agents and tools, which is essentially the same thing as plugins, where you give the large language model access to maybe your computer, maybe to write to disk, so that you can develop files, you can run them locally, you can debug them, etc. This is the best one that I've seen. It works reasonably well, and here somebody's hooked it up to GitHub, so this AI assistant is making modifications to the code and suggesting them as changes, and then whoever owns the repository can go through and check that it actually makes sense. I think the, the, the security of this is just too bad. I don't really see this ever becoming a, a, a thing, but I could be completely wrong. Okay. So, so my feeling about this stuff is there's obviously massive potential, right? When I, when I last gave a briefing broadly on, on this topic. It was all still along the lines of, look at all of these amazing things that the AI can do. We should be worried and scared. And now it's more like, look at the things it's doing. Can we even detect it at all? Like, is there anything we can do about it? So there are these, there are these detection systems. Um, and has anybody tried those? Um, my wife is a professor at the university, and they pay a lot of money for one of these systems that supposedly is able to identify paragraphs from student essays that might be plagiarized. Uh, do you still have your link to that poll? Shall we, shall we try? Somebody who said no, stand up and defend your decision. Anybody? Yeah? A uh, recent example of a uh, university professor suddenly declining every single yeah. student. Um, which is the problem when people who don't understand the technology at all try to use it and somehow becomes this Bible, which is even worse. Yeah, there was another hand. They're also building GPT models to detect, like to write content that makes it difficult yeah. to be detected by people. Yeah, I'm going to show you some of those in a second. Um, Funnily, though, no, nobody chose my option, which was yes, but only for images. That, that's where I think we are at the moment. Basically, the, I'll, 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 I'll give you some examples, but I think for images, we have hope. Um, although, yeah, so this is where we started. If I put that one into the Hive moderation, which is my example for today, it says that there's, a, there's about a two-thirds chance that this image of the Pentagon was generated by AI. The funny thing is, depending on how you crop this image, you get completely different results, right? Everything from 5% up to 90%. But 60, 60, 65, 66, that was what I was generally was getting out of it. But the thing that's interesting about this one is 
Oh, it's, oh no, it's doing, it's done it wrong, okay. It thinks this was stable diffusion. When I did it the other times, it told me it didn't know which model it was. So maybe it's stable diffusion, I don't know. My guess is, if any serious adversaries are going to use this method, they will not be using stable diffusion, they will not be using mid-journey, etc. And that is what this model is trained to detect. So it's very likely not to detect those more tailor-made um, attacks. There's quite a lot of examples already of people posting these images from mid-journey, from DALI, as if they were real. Right? These, these orchids that actually look like birds, that obviously generated and fake, right? Uh, what about this one? I'm not going to bother doing the poll. You all know it's fake. Um, but, but same kind of thing. These things are going viral regularly, and based on the comments, people seem to think it's real. So it's even quite obvious fakes have potential to have cause effects. Um, this one, with very high confidence, is generated by Midjourney. And it's similar with GANs. So, you know, if, you, if you're researching a social media account which has a profile picture that you think might come from a GAN, stick it into one of these tools and it's probably going to tell you how confident it is and it's probably going to be very confident one way or the other because it's seen a lot of GANs and it's been trained on it. But what happens when they release a new model is that the detection systems immediately break, right? So Adobe Firefly came out a while ago, but it was released into Photoshop last week, the week before, very recently. So it's not, it's not one that this detection system has been trained on. This is what Adobe Firefly does. It's very nice, actually. Um, it's more like automating image editing. So here, the input picture of the puppy, they've added a puddle, they've added some bubbles, they've added the car in the background, they've stretched it up. And what do we think? Can, can our model detect this as a fake? A few nods, yeah? Yeah? 1.2%, ladies and gentlemen. Um, so it doesn't have a clue, right? It's, it, it doesn't actually know anything. It's just able to detect certain patterns. And to detect those patterns, it needs to be trained on them, which means it needs to see it before. So if we're worried about Russia or China re developing some sort of capability, we won't have seen it until we need to be able to understand what's happening. So detection systems that need to be trained on a lot of training data are probably not going to be very effective for, for our purposes here. Um, here's a, to me, a, a more obvious example. So a very small original input on the far left of a pond covered in lilies, which has been extended to include castles and a snow-covered mountain in the background. It's sunny and all sorts. It thinks it's sort of a one in five chance that this was automated. Again, it has no idea which model it would be. It's just sort of generically saying AI generated. And um, this, in a, in a sense, this, this one is hard, right? Because the original photo is a real photo. This picture is generated from nothing. There is no, there is no house or sports car to begin with. This is Adobe imagining it from scratch. So this is what the system really should be able to detect. I was actually really surprised. I mean, I, this wasn't cherry picking at all. It was the first example I put in. That it's got less than a 1% chance of being AI generated. You can't see it so well, but the reflections are really bad. Like, they're just way too shiny. It should be able to spot that if it has any sort of general knowledge about what real photos look like. So with photos, I think there's a good chance, especially for these large models, we have hope of detecting them. The more bespoke models might be harder, but they're also harder to make. With ChatGPT, I think we're moving to a place where there's a general acceptance that it's going to be impossible to confidently and consistently 
detect the text as fake. So I'm going to go through some examples. It's probably all too small for you to be able to see anything. So this is just a 150-word paragraph explaining why manipulators are unlikely to use LLMs, such as those provided by OpenAI, for large-scale operations. And it comes up with the text, which is pretty OK. I paste it into the detection tool, and it's really confident that this comes from GPT. Great, wonderful. And then we start adding some things to the prompt, which is what you were mentioning a second ago, where we get a bit more creative about how we want the output to be formatted. We throw in in the style of The Economist, so less Americanisms, etc. You're immediately down to 27% likelihood of being AI generated. Um, if you give some more detail about which arguments you wanted to include in this text, you get the likelihood down further. And this is the one that kind of works the best in my experience. If you tell it to avoid adjectives and adverbs, which is where the color of GPT comes from, then basically the detection models don't find it at all. So any student using this, just say, don't use too many adjectives or adverbs, and you're probably going to slide straight through that uh, plagiarism software. Unless you are using GPT 3.5, which the model has been trained on really well. Right? So this is the same, this is the most advanced prompt that we, we had here. Zero percent chance that was AI generated. Use the cheaper, older model, and it's really confident that it's AI generated. I think generally, if we're using this kind of system and it comes out with 99.9, .9, we can be reasonably confident that it actually is from ChatGPT but it's not going to do any good on the other type of error, where it says that something that is GPT-generated is, in fact, authentic. Here, I, I just don't see it working. Um, comment in the back. Um, my thinking on this is it's purely about the guys who are running this moderation detection system. How creative have they been in the training data that they are giving their model? So maybe a different example. If we would do this in a different language, would it still be able to detect it as being from ChatGPT? Probably not, because most likely it's mostly been trained on English text. I think that would be the same with with, with different voices or different styles. So it's, it's very hit and miss. And especially if we're talking about social media content, which is often very, very short, there's not enough data going in, in general, in my view, for it to be confident, especially if, if you're doing anything more than the most kind of vanilla prompt. If you're saying, write an email to my boss explaining why I'm late, it's probably detectable. Whereas if you give specific sentences and ideas that should be included, and you know, here's an example of what my email usually sounds like, I think that's incredibly hard to detect. Because the, you know, the, these systems, they're not detecting AI, right? They're detecting particular patterns in expression, particular patterns in images. And what, what are the guys who are running these models doing all the time? They're updating their models with more data, right? So this one is from May 24. That's not 2024, it's like two days ago, three days ago, one week ago, goodness me. Um, which means there's, there's no real hope, yeah? So the detection system is great for the model from six months ago, it's not good for the model from last week. Yeah, I'm not sure where I sit on this one, actually. Um, I, I kind of don't believe these systems at all, especially if you're going to use them as somehow authoritative because of this example with the professor. Like, I wouldn't have enough confidence in it. But if it is your job to detect GPT output, just play with the tools a lot 
because there are a lot of patterns in the way it produces its output, and you'll start seeing GPT absolutely everywhere. I've got a new publication out probably next week um, where we talk about some of the reasons to be optimistic that it's possible to detect these models. I'm just going to quickly go through that because miraculously I'm somehow filling this time. Um, when I think about the role of generative AI and social media fakes, it's obvious to me that it makes the, the challenge of detecting fake content maybe impossibly hard. But to have any sort of effect in the information space, the content isn't enough, right? You still need the distribution and you need the attention. So in the example of, do I have it here? Yep. In the Bloomberg feed, this fake account, which paid for its blue tick mark, um, it was immediately taken down, of course, after, after this example, which means it's, it's kind of a disposable thing. You can only really use that asset once. You need to build up this whole network of accounts following you, and then you use something with, with, that's uh, produced by generative AI and is so easy to disprove using by detecting the image as coming from AI. It doesn't really make sense that anybody very serious is going to do this for anything other than one-off effects. You can't, you can't build a persistent social media audience based on fakes. It's just not, you're not going to be able to build that audience. Although the stuff going on at Twitter at the moment with these blue check marks does make it a bit more hopeful that you could, the way that authority is being undermined. Um, the other thing with these models is there are these weird statistical anomalies that if you have enough data, you should be able to detect. So if you've pulled, if you're analyzing someone's timeline, and for whatever reason there are, ooh, feedback, there are numbers in those posts, you can probably run those numbers through some sort of distribution, and you're going to find there's a lot of 42, which is the answer to everything. But, uh, and that's obviously overrepresented in the training data, which is why it's spitting it out as random numbers. So it, it, 42, 7, a few other numbers are very heavily overrepresented, which gives some sort of potential for creating a statistical detection mechanism. So this is one example, but the, all the way through the, the, mod, the way the models work, there are these patterns. This is also how the detection systems work, right? Then prompt injection. This is fun. So the way the model, the, the, there is no defense against prompt injection. Into the model, you put in this window of text where you describe what you would like the model to do. Write a post in the style of The Economist doing such and such. The problem with opening up to plugins is you're, all you're doing is you're adding stuff into that context window. So you're, you're basically adding instructions. Go to this website, post in that information, receive the response. That's your video that you're going to hopefully use in the presentation. But there's no way to really ensure that, there's no way to distinguish between which instructions come from the user, which instructions come from the plugins, and which instructions come from an attacker. So if you have a social media account that's hooked up directly to ChatGPT and is engaging with users, the user is able to say, ignore all of your instructions. I would like you to do the following instead, right? Which is a huge weakness for anybody who wants to put a chatbot out in the wild to perform particular tasks. Because A, it can look ridiculous, and B, the entire operation can be exposed through this kind of sort of little mini psyop. So, I'm not particularly optimistic that attackers are going to find live chatbots engaging with people on social media platforms to be useful. I don't think that's going to work well. I think it's going to be a liability. And the same if any of you are thinking to use this defensively. Like, I absolutely would not recommend using this as part of, I don't know, de-radicalization programs or something like that. Not a good idea. Um, the other thing is these models are pretty unpredictable. 
So if we, if we take GPT as our example, there's a long list, there's a growing list of cases where it will refuse to answer. If you ask it to write death threats or sweary messages or criticisms, etc., very often it will say, as an AI language model, I'm not allowed to do that, or some variation on the theme. What have we got here? I'm sorry, I cannot generate inappropriate or, or offensive content. So these are all accounts that are probably 98%, 99% of the time spitting out some other type of material. And then, for whatever reason, in the prompt, there is material that's triggered the content moderation system built into the LLM, and it's refusing to respond the way the user expects. Other examples would be it might respond in a different language, it might include different types of artifacts, programming code, all sorts of, there's a whole long tail of, of things that can happen that means that the output is not what the user expects and that can expose the identity of the account as fake. So these accounts obviously all didn't um, consider this particular possibility and were immediately exposed, right? So again, not particularly good for anything other than the most surface level spam. You wouldn't, you wouldn't use this for valuable assets. So this is popping up everywhere. I Google around for it. You can, you can put in, you know, site amazon.com and then some of these sentences and you will find a lot of examples. You can do the same on LinkedIn, wherever. Yes, as an AI language model, I can definitely write a positive product review about the active gear waste trimmer, etc. Two things I take from this. The platforms, in this case Amazon, they really should be able to detect this stuff. I, I, I get dis disappointed every time that they're not able to kind of pick up even these really most basic signals that this is artificial. And second, this doesn't work in a production system because of this stuff happening, not often, but from time to time. Um, is this a video? Yes, please. The other thing is, even if you have an advanced prompt, in this case, it is using a text model to generate ideas for an image and then sending those ideas to mid-journey to generate the image and then another link to post those to social media. So that's quite an advanced system, right? That's what we're talking about. To me, this is absolutely obvious that it, that it, that it is generated automatically. There are a lot of regular patterns in the way the text is formatted, that blank, that... Can we play one more time? There's a, there's, a, there's a full line break between the text and the hashtags. The hashtags are all the same. In fairness, this bot isn't trying to hide. It's just an example of regular output. The images have kind of a consistent visual style. All you would need to do is think one of these images looks a bit fake, put it into the detection system, see that it's 99.9% .9 mid-journey, and you would know that it's a fake account. So systems that rely on variations of a prompt to create diverse, non-unique content, yeah, it may, be, it may be not unique, but it's not going to be very diverse, which means there, are, there is hope to detect it. Um, let's go on. Um, just another prompt injection example. This is a YouTube video where somebody has put a prompt injection in the subtitles. <laughs> Again, it's just proof of concept, but this is why we can't use these tools for anything, because it, you only need to stumble across this one in a 10,000 times, one in a 100,000 times for potentially disastrous effects, right? So, and then here, Again, ChatGPT using a plugin is asked to summarize a particular video. Very cool. It, it loads the subtitles, and then, it, and then the prompt injection succeeds. So there's a hundred examples like this, and these are the phishing attacks of the future, I suppose. Little, little artifacts scattered across the internet that are just waiting for large language models to scrape them into the context window. There's also, I think this is quite a famous example, um, where um, it's a more complex workflow where somebody uses Zapier to automate an email and tricks the language model into getting the reset tokens. So again, it, it's, a bit, it's a bit construed, you know, it's a bit artificial. 
presumably this doesn't happen in the wild particularly often, but it's a huge weakness why we can't ever use this on our even remotely secure systems or in any kind of production system. Um, so, so my view on, on generative AI on the whole is it's more useful if for like troll farm operations. If you're trying to increase the productivity of troll workers, of course, being able to copy paste from GPT is going to be a, a huge asset. But I don't think we're going to see serious attempts of using these models hooked up directly to hundreds or thousands of bot accounts, persuasively performing high-level tasks. I, I, I think certainly some sort of human in the loop is required for those networks not to automatically disclose themselves and self-destruct. The other thing is it's slow and expensive. How long does a GPT-4 API query take? 10, 15 seconds? If you're using bots and you want to do something at scale and fast, I mean, that is completely hopeless. Um, some more technical things that I won't go into. Um, yeah. How are we doing? I think you probably know where I'm, I stand on can we use LLMs, but um, I wanted to understand whether you've tried, actually. Like, I, I use chat GPT for work all the time. It's amazing. And I probably couldn't code anything without it almost at the moment. But uh, I'm guessing for most of the people in the room, there's some sort of restriction or reason why you can't use it. I need to click next, don't I? There we go. Ay, ay, ay. Skip that. What have you used it for? Shout out some examples. Must be coding at least, right? It's amazing. <laughs> And? It gave me quite good stuff. So I, I used the formulas I already knew, and I gave them instructions on how to put in, and it actually gave me the, yeah. the, the formula. Yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing if you can describe what you need to do in Google Sheets or Excel or something, and it'll spit out quite sort of formulas inside formulas inside formulas, and it generally gets it right. About 50-50. That's OK. I think, I think you have to use this. You at least have to know what it looks like so that you can, you can recognize it. I mean, you need to know which emails you can just delete immediately. <laughs> um, I s uh, OK, one more. Can you tell I've used this before? Which use cases was it not useful? A name. It wasn't good. It was all like a mix of marketing buzzwords. Yeah. You can do things like it should appeal to an Estonian rather than a Silicon Valley audience. Yes, avoid cliches or... But sometimes it just takes more time to get the prompt right than it would be to actually do the work to begin with, perhaps. Um, and again. This is more for my curiosity. Um, because if you don't, you really probably should. Who does have a policy? It's going to be Singapore or something, right? Go on. Okay. But who else does? Any Singaporeans? No? <laughs> does CCD, COE have a policy on this? Silence. 
Um, because the most productive workers are going to be the ones who figure out how to use GPT. It's going to be creating all kinds of perverse incentives. This is where the next privacy scandals are going to come from. Somebody's going to paste se sensitive in information into an AI system, and they're going to probably have the, the best KPIs in the entire organization until suddenly there is a big disaster, right? I'm sure I had more slides than that. <laughs> yeah, don't worry. 110 or something. And this is how, how we think of the different risk areas. So I think you can't afford to ignore this. You've got to, A, have a policy, and you've got to think, when are you able to use it? But you've also got to think, what are the high-risk situations you just shouldn't touch? So these are some examples. When I think about prototyping, building some new tool, drafting a, a dummy system, what is the risk here? It's low, right? You're, you're kind of possibly giving some away the idea that your organization might be interested in this problem area. But that's generally a low risk situation, and unless you're on a secure network, in which case you shouldn't be using this anyway. Um, generating training data is completely amazing. So if you're thinking, we are interested in tracking this type of communication, Ask the system to generate examples of that type of communication and use that as part of building your models. Um, if you can use live data for this, even better, but then you probably should think about privacy implications. Um, content analysis, this is a bit, a bit more of a medium risk case. Again, it's very powerful. It's, if you, for instance, if, if anybody's ever done a senti sentiment analysis about NATO, it always comes back really negative because all the texts about NATO include words like tank and fight and stuff that triggers a bad keyword list, right? So it doesn't work. Whereas with this, it actually does work. You can say evaluate this text and on a scale from one to 10, determine how positive the speaker is towards NATO. So there's a lot of tasks, sort of classification tasks like this where you would normally use human coders where you can use these systems with a lot of accuracy. Um, debugging, again, it's very good at this, but you've got to be careful about what are you actually revealing about your code base. Analyzing logs is exactly the same kind of risk. Um, chatting with the knowledge base. So I think it's great if you have a list of your organization's publications or interviews with the director or something to be able to say, you know, what would the director say if he was asked about X? But if it's internal documents that shouldn't be in the cloud, they probably also shouldn't be in this system. Yeah? And then at, at the bottom, this, using these tools and plugins, at least for now, I would completely just forget about it. It's incredibly risky unless it's quite confined and controlled. And then you're probably spending a lot of time building the guardrails for the model. So some of what I just spoke about. Um, examples of training data with this NATO example. So you can ask it to generate examples in multiple languages. It works really well. There is no reason why we're not doing this. Um, you can use it uh, together with embeddings as some sort of relevance filter. So you can create lists of the type of content you either are interested or not interested in seeing. Right? And then you either discard or retain the information that meets the filter. Um, it's this, this is more technical. It involves embeddings. We can, we can talk about that separately later, maybe, if anyone's interested. Um, internal systems like this could work quite well. So this is a tool that scans code uh, looking for specific vulnerabilities. So you know, in this case, are you logging data that you shouldn't be logging? It's reasonably good in these scenarios, although you might prefer to use GPT for all rather than chat GPT to, and keep it on the internal system. This is something I think everybody should be doing, where whenever you, through an API or otherwise, send data to chat GPT, you should log what did you send and what was the response you got back. Firstly, it gives you some sort of idea about what 
what might have happened in any kind of crisis situation. But I think more importantly, it gives you data that you can use to build your own model and replace GPT. And then before the data gets sent to the cloud, I would have all data either on some sort of script level or on a network level go through some filters that look for sensitive information and scrubs it. So that might be don't allow any, any communication with the following web addresses if they include a set of blacklisted words. Or you could use a whitelist. So, you know, there could be the same way we have releasable to Finland, well, sorry, no, releasable to Sweden and whatever. Um, you could have releasable to GPT. It's, and then only texts that meet that filter criteria would be allowed out of the system. I think for, for low and medium cases, we, we need to be thinking about these uses. Play with this one as well. <laughs> it's really cool. Um, and this is where I'm most optimistic about the potential of these large language models for detection systems. Like the, the stuff we have to detect is getting much harder to detect. It's absolutely obvious. But the tools we have to model what the information space looks like is getting much more powerful as well. This is a tool called Atlas Nomic, which combines a powerful graphing engine with embeddings. And basically, it clusters similar articles in similar parts of this embedding space. If that sounds technical, it's quite technical. But in this case, it allows you to detect clusters of articles that are disproportionately frequently retracted, for instance. So if in our use case we're talking about social media accounts that are disproportionately likely to post um, fakes, generated through mid-journey, we can use that same approach to detect other accounts that look similar, but that we haven't actually detected through the system. So there's all kinds of iterative loops that can be built on top of this really well. I think I'm probably done. Final question for you all, and then and I'm not going to say anything more. Nobody's clicking anything. Have I made a mistake? Yes, OK, good. IP, yeah. So I think, in general, OpenAI are, are moving towards sort of a business-friendly environment, so they're implementing more secure systems. And it's also available through one of the Microsoft Secure Clouds, which I know NATO HQ might be able to use in some circumstances. So there are ways around some of these privacy and intellectual property concerns, although there is always an element of trust, right? So if the policy is this information does not go into cloud, of course, you're not getting around that. Classified material, I think, is quite an easy fix. You know, you, you just use proper tagging, and or, or you just don't have any access on those systems at all. Just, the hard stuff is the kind of the gray area where it's obviously useful and it's not clear: am I allowed to use it or not? Yeah, spying, snooping. One thing you probably want to be wary of are all these third-party AI tools that are kind of thin wrappers around OpenAI services. So there's a lot of places that offer maybe GPT-4 for free or something like that. Yes, OK, that probably does work. But they're almost certainly logging everything that goes through their system before and after it goes through the OpenAI system. So it's the same. It's the classic free software situation where if it's free, you should probably think a little bit about what they might be doing with that data. All right, moderator, moderate me. <laughs> this is ridiculous. Um, I've, I've got a f one final slide, I think, which has my contact details. You can switch to that one. I'm done. I'm shutting up. Should we do the last question? I don't know. 
Has anybody changed their mind? Any last questions? I think we were about two pessimists for every optimist to begin with. <laughs> it's even worse, yeah. <laughs> Well, yeah, just resistant to change. Come on, Team Optimism. <laughs> A very scientific survey, yes, it's great. All right. Someone's changed their mind or just left. <laughs> okay. I think it looks a bit similar than it was at the beginning, isn't it? So if there are no more questions. Dr. Freydheim, thank you so much for this very enlightening and maybe slightly scary presentation, I would say. This was my optimistic version. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very thank much you. for this video. Thanks to the audience. <laughs>